so <clears throat> we are at Vajra Statement uh, 25 of the first chapter. Uh, on Monday, mm, we looked at the statement uh, that says that uh, no matter what, uh, uh, more, no matter which of the three categories of vows, uh, and the three categories, I think it's good to say that way, the three categories of vows, uh, the three categories of trainings is the individual liberation vows, uh, the bodhisattva uh, uh, precepts or vows, and then the uh, tantric uh, samayas, uh, the vajrayana samayas. Uh, so these are the uh, three categories of vows. So chapter two, three, four uh, are basically elaborations of these three vows. So uh, chapter, sorry, three, four, five. So chapter three, uh, is called the Vinaya Pratimoksha. The chapter four, the training of the Bodhisattvas, and chapter five, <clears throat> the observance of mantra awareness holders. Those are the three categories of vows. So statement twenty-four makes clear that uh, no matter what mm, category of vows we are talking about. Uh, they all have the single point, uh, the single kind of uh, unity uh, in teaching us how to avoid the 10 non-virtues. And, you know, how to practice the virtues. There are obviously many ways to um, distinguish uh, the three categories of vows based on what, uh, what is being emphasized. Uh, so one way, for example, to look at those three vows uh, and the ways, three categories of vows and what they emphasize, you know, another way, uh, not, not according to the Gong Chik here per se, but another way would be uh, that famous saying, uh, that famous verse that says, uh, not to do <clears throat> evil, uh, not to commit any uh, negative uh, act or evil uh, action, uh, to uh, sincerely practice uh, all the virtues and to purify the mind. This is the teaching of all Buddhas. So this verse, right? I, I think you, you, you have come across eh? or maybe know this verse very well. Uh, so this, uh, not to do any evil, uh, to engage in all virtues and to purify your mind. This is the teaching of all Buddhas. So sometimes this verse is used to also explain the three categories of vows, which means that uh, in the uh, prati moksha, in the individual liberation, which is what prati moksha means, uh, individual liberation, there is a more specific reference to prati moksha. Uh, a more specific reference to prati moksha uh, refers to the over two hundred uh, different uh, vows of training uh, that monks and nuns, uh, fully ordained monks and nuns, uh, observe these vows. Those sets are called pratimoksha, more specifically. But, but here, the pratimoksha is more, a more general meaning, uh, which is the vows that we take, uh, the vows that we take uh, in order uh, to liberate ourselves from suffering. Uh, so it's called individual liberation, uh, pratimoksha. So the pratimoksha vows, if we, we explain the three categories of vows according to that verse, uh, then not to do even the slightest negative act, uh, even the slightest evil, not to do that, that is the summary for pratimoksha. Then to cultivate or to practice uh, the myriad, uh, the infinite uh, virtues, uh, that is said to summarize uh, the bodhisattva training.
yeah, the practice of the six perfections, for example, <clears throat> the development of the 10,000 virtues of bodhisattvas. Then to purify the mind is said to be, to summarize the category of the secret mantra or the tantric samayas. So this is also a helpful way of looking at the three categories of vows. That pratimoksha is to prevent us from creating the causes of suffering. So do not commit evil, even the slightest. Practice all the virtues, no matter how small. Bodhisattva training. Completely remove ignorance, confusion, afflictive emotions from our mind is what the Vajrayana Samayas are designed for. Yeah, so that's another way uh, to understand mm, the three vows. But here, the point in statement 24 is to say uh, the three vows, uh, so without contradicting you know, what I just said uh, about how you can distinguish the three categories of vows, here, rather than distinguishing, uh, statement 24 points out the underlying uh, identity of the three categories of vows. In fact, they are all about giving up the 10 non-virtues. You see how Kyoba Rinpoche would consistently frame all the higher teachings, the quote-unquote higher teachings, he would frame them, he would uh, like contextualize them with things from the most basic level, avoiding the 10 non-virtues, which based on my explanation, right, is the first, the Pratimoksha. So this is a very uh, clear, you know, style of Kyoba Rinpoche. All the profound things, yeah, that, that like very exotic, very Vajrayana, very high, you know, he always takes it back to, he says, you know what? On the ground level, on the ground level, this is already there. And this is how it is there. Uh, so I give, I'll give another example, you know, like in the Vajrayana teachings, there are teachings, I, I, I think you should not be surprised by now, although generally we don't talk about this uh, in, the, in, in, in just a general, because people might misunderstand, you know, and say, oh my God, this, how can this be Buddhist teachings? Uh, or, or some people might misunderstand by saying, ooh, ooh, I, I, I want that, you know, <laughs> which is like, it is in Vajrayana teachings, you know, there are uh, practices uh, that involve, you know, uh, the use of sexual energy. But, uh, as I said also, you know, like His Holiness Himself said, He doesn't believe that this is a living tradition. You know, he thinks that somehow, somewhere in the history, uh, in, in the development of Buddhism in Tibet, that living tradition stopped. Uh, so He says, now it's all practice. Uh, in a symbolic way and not in any, but uh, there's a lot of evidence that, uh, especially the Mahasiddhas uh, in India in ancient times, uh, there is the use, uh, the manipulation of sexual energy and also involving uh, uh, physical uh, partners and con consorts. Mm. Where there is no no mundane, you know, attachments of that sort going on. Uh, but even those things, those types of things, uh, Kyoba Rinpoche uh, would again bring it back to the very beginning. Uh, he says, like all 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 this, like uh, very exotic, and maybe. He did not use this word, but you maybe you want to say like very kind of, you know, mysterious, sexy, you know, <laughs> trainings, you know, like you how you reverse, you know, the uh, energy, 
and you do not like let your energy out, you know, you have to pull it back in, all of this, yeah. And there's references like that. He says, Buddha Rady taught this at the very basic level. When he gave this training to monks and nuns and say, do not, do not engage in sexual activity. So he says, what, what is that really? That is about gaining mastery. He says, it's not about like suppressing, although superficially you look, and, and of course, I think to be frank, maybe monks, uh, especially in the Tibetan system, you know, they're brought into the monastery at such a young age, right? Uh, uh, these monks might just be kind of suppressing, you know, but actually, Kyoba Rinpoche says, the essence of what Buddha's rule about celibacy for monks and nuns is to actually already uh, begin the training uh, of mastering uh, your energies, mastering the use of your life energies. Uh, and he says, if you follow that vow, if you take your, that vow, uh, then when you're when you develop that mastery, then when the time comes for Vajrayana methods to be used, you have the capacity. Right now, if you're not mastered that, if you are not in control of that energy, yeah, all the talk about you know, harnessing that energy to make things, you know, to make your practice more amazing, more this, more that, and he says, that's all pointless talk. That's all, in fact, not just pointless, it can lead to problems. It can lead to problems, he says. So this is very much, you know, Kyoba Rinpoche's style. You can say, yeah, very distinctive. Everything, you know, from the very exotic, very profound, you know, very mysterious. Uh, he takes it back to the very fundamentals. And he says, here is uh, where Buddha already gave this instruction, where Buddha already taught this. Yeah. So uh, 24 puts that point very clearly. Uh, no matter which of the three categories of the vows that we are talking about, Avoiding the 10 non-virtues is the same for all three. So uh, Sobish uh, notes the concluding sentence. In other words, non-virtue in any form is to be abandoned through all three categories of the vows. Now Vajra Statement 25. The vows become three because their possessor changes. There's some very technical expressions here. The possessor means the one who holds the vows. So this statement is saying, why the categories of vows become three? Because in the previous statement, it says, right? No matter which category of the three vows, it is taught for giving up the 10 non-virtues. This statement is addressing, well, if that's the case, why even differentiate into three categories, right? If the whole point, if the point for each of the categories is to avoid the 10 non-virtues, is to give up the 10 non-virtues, and for that matter, all the non-virtues, why not just say that, right? Why, 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 why then do we have a division into three categories of vows. Here, Kilbert and Bajay says, because the person who holds these vows, they change. Meaning then, if we want to talk about how the categories are divided, then we should understand that they are not divided on the basis of uh, anything except that 
as the vow holder, the possessor, matures, then the, the effort to purify the 10 non-virtues needs to be more subtle. So on the level of, if you're still at the Pratimoksha level, right? Then you should focus on not harming. When you have evolved to the point that you quite naturally don't harm anymore or have minimized harm, or at the very least, you are not intentionally seeking to harm, right? Then your capacity to cultivate virtues is there. And so then naturally, right? Even if you are observing the literal vow that belongs in the category of Pratimoksha, now those Pratimoksha vows have turned into Bodhisattva trainings. See, at the beginning, I don't want to kill. I don't want to steal. I don't want to practice, you know, cult, uh, uh, engage in sexual misconduct because I don't want to cause harm. I don't want to cause harm to myself. I don't want to cause harm to other people. But as my faculties, as my spiritual maturity grows, then it becomes not just about not causing harm either to self or to other, it is now quite naturally also about benefiting others. As in, it, it turns into that. See, it's not even like, okay, now I need to go take more fancy vows. <laughs> but it has evolved. Because the vow holder has evolved. Uh, and then when, when you genuinely do everything, you know, and you're genuinely guided by, uh, for the benefit, this, this resolve uh, to really benefit others, then the same do's and don'ts that you observe, now it has grown into the category of Secret Mantra Samayas. Where your view, your confusion is being purified. So here, the statement is made in response to people claim that the vows are differentiated into three through the different things one must observe. You see, the general idea, he says, general idea is they say, well, because in the first set of vows, you, you observe these vows. Second set of vows, second category, it's these vows. Third category is these vows. Yeah. So they are different. That way, Kilbarimbaji says, well, maybe they are different that way, but the real difference is not due to that. It's not that, you know, somehow, uh, like, so, so why this statement is so important? Let me give you this one. Uh, you might say, well, I did not take the vow to not, mm, I did not take the vow uh, to benefit others. So if I don't benefit others, I, there's no mistake. This view will say no. Whether you take the vow or you don't take the vow, if you are not operating from the point of, from the position of benefiting others, then you will always be trapped in confusion, in self-cherishing. 
whether you take the vow or you don't take the vow. Or, or even some people will say, oh, I, I'm not going to take the vow uh, for uh, not getting intoxicated because I still like to drink. So then, you know, from this view, it says, well, whether you take the vow or you don't take the vow, you know, when you get intoxicated, that is a negative. That is a negative. Has nothing to do with whether you take the vow or you don't take the vow. Why do you take the vow? You take the vow to protect yourself and to protect others. First, you have to take the vow to think about protecting yourself. Then you take the vow to protect others. Then you take the vow to go beyond the labels of self and other. That's another way of looking at the three categories. When you're at the level of the first category, all the vows you take, it doesn't matter, even if they are tantric vows, you know, primarily you take it because to protect yourself. But you know you're at the second level when whenever you observe these vows, you are thinking in terms of, I am really, like genuinely, you're feeling like this is really to protect others. Then on the third level of observing the vows, right, the secret mantra is when uh, you're observing the same vow, but now uh, your observance of the vow is no longer based on uh, ideas of, oh, there is me, there is others, should I prioritize me, should I prioritize other? You have, you have gone beyond uh, this kind of division. So first, you should wear the mask to protect yourself. <laughs> then you develop it to, I'm wearing the mask to protect others, you know. Then you are a real expert in mask wearing, where you wear it without thinking of self or other anymore. That would be the three vows evolving in the context of wearing the mask. <laughs> They say the mistake is to tell, you know, Americans, you know, oh, wear the mask because it's to protect other people. See, no, you have to first start with, you know, you need to protect yourself. After they're willing to do that, you know, you might inspire them and say, now understand that you're also protecting others. And then, you know, a real... A uh, vow holder have no concepts of holding or not holding anymore. Yeah. So here the commentary says, uh, people say that one ascertains the vows or one distinguishes the categories of vows as three because the things one must abandon and the things one must practice uh, and the things one must attain, they exist separately for each category. Yeah, so there are explanations that say in the Pratimoksha, right, what you have to abandon is this. What you have to observe is this. Uh, and what you will achieve is this. And for each of the category, uh, they distinguish it that way. But Kyobar and Bajir say, no, that's not how. Uh, so however, this is not the point. So... Uh, Chodra, the Makirti says, in the Dorshema, it is explained that a turquoise bead, yeah, so, so the example of a turquoise bead, it says, mm, even though it is only one turquoise, it becomes three ornaments through the differences of who is wearing it. Is it worn by the king? It is, is it worn by the minister? Or is it worn by the subject? Yeah, ordinary people. Similarly, in applying this reasoning also to eating food, 
the three vows are one concerning abandoning non-virtue and practicing virtue. Yeah. So the food is say, you know, like a food that, you know, that if it is the same food, you know, giving it to uh, it being eaten by an ordinary person, it being eaten by a minister, and it being eaten by a king. So the idea here, whether it's food or it's turquoise, is fundamentally it's the same food, it's the same turquoise. Right? So with regards to the three categories of vows, fundamentally it's the same point. Avoiding non-virtues, practicing the virtues. Avoid the 10 non-virtues, abandon the 10 non-virtues, Pick up, take up the 10 virtues. The analogy of the food is, is as follows. An ordinary person being nourished by the same food allows this ordinary person, this, let's just compare one person, one person, one person, comp allows this one person uh, at most, right? especially in the ancient times, to work in the field, right? And the results of that work right, to support his family. But the minister, assuming it's not a corrupt minister, <laughs> yeah, eating the same food, right? Allows him to make decisions and to do his work that will benefit not just his family, again, assuming it's not a corrupt minister, because it seems like that's what they are all doing these days, allows the minister to benefit the whole area that he's responsible for. That same food eaten by the king allows the king to do things and make decisions that will affect the whole nation. Same food. Same, you know. I, me observing not killing and His Holiness the Dalai Lama observing non-killing. What changes is the effect and the capacity. So same with that turquoise. It's like uh, on eBay, you know, like way back, people are selling like, you know, the gum that was chewed by some famous person. I don't know how they prove it, you know, but it's like, you know, I, I remember many years ago, you know, it, people advertise uh, this gum was chewed by Madonna or whatever, you know, at some concert and she gave it to someone, you know, <laughs> and they have a picture like she gave it to someone and that someone now is selling that gum on Facebook, you know, same, you know, same gum, you know, if the gum uh, was chewed by me, you know, like even if I gave someone money, they're not going to take that gum. Yeah. But if it is chewed by Madonna, you know, I say, oh, you know, it's the same gum, you know. <laughs> but depending on who chewed it, you know, it makes all the difference. And so through the differentiation of the various worthy persons, it appears as if one teaches the ornaments of the foods as individual things, as different things. Thus, by virtue of that, the words through which they are expressed the three categories of vows appear as individual expressions. However, the meaning to be expressed is that the virtues one must practice and the evil one must abandon are respectively just one thing. The training in these three vows includes fewer or more numerous ways of establishing them as root and branch precepts. In other words, it just becomes more and more precise. 
Furthermore, concerning the status of the higher, medium, and lower essence of the vows, concerning the differences in the process of the rituals, place, time, master, and disciples, concerning the manner of the arising of the vows, and so on, they were established as the three vows, which is very well known. So he says, yes, of course, you know, the way you take the Pratimoksha vow, uh, who you take it from, how you take it, what are the requirements? He says, of course, there are all those differences. You know, he's not disputing that. But he says, in reality, however, the three vows have a single vital point. And that vital point we have to understand and remember. Uh, so another example that I, will, I can use, I, I usually use is like Pratimoksha vow. On the uh, so the vow of like say uh, not killing, right? On the level of pratimoksha, if you look at the level of pratimoksha, uh, not being a vegetarian, for example, is not killing because on the level of pratimoksha, it says uh, if you eat right meat that you did not kill yourself, you did not instruct someone to kill, then you are not involved in the killing. Then it's not killing, according to Pratimoksha. So that should be the basic level. At the very least, you should be able to practice that level. You did not kill. You did not instruct someone to kill for you. In the monk's vows, it says even more specifically, and you do not suspect that they deliberately killed it for you. And so, so those are like in the monk's vows, it says, then that, that meat is, is, permissible to consume. If you did not kill it, you did not see or hear, and you did not think that someone deliberately killed it for you, then it says, it's not breaking your pratimoksha vow if you consume that. But when we get to bodhisattva vow, then at that level, you have evolved to the level of, it's not enough that I did not kill it myself. I did not tell someone to kill it. But the fact that it was killed as food for me, I, I cannot eat anymore. So that's when you have evolved to the bodhisattva level. Then when you have evolved to the siddha level, the uh, secret mantra level, just to perceive that meat as meat, Is already killing. Meaning not recognizing the deity nature. You see how subtle now that to kill is anytime you perceive someone, you know, as ordinary, then you have killed the deity that they are. Huh? Like you say, well, that's then basically every day all I'm doing is, you know, killing deities left and right and up and down. Yeah, it's true from, from that level. Yeah. Uh, killing deities left and right and up and down. Uh, and at all hours of the day and night, I'm killing this deity. Because I don't view this as deity.
so Atisha said, you know, he said, you know, when I first just was training in the uh, Pratimoksha level, when he first became a monk then, in his context, in his context, Pratimoksha means monk. So he says, when I first took my Pratimoksha vows, there wasn't any two week period that I did not have something to confess. Because according to the monastic rules, every two weeks, uh, there's a purification ritual uh, during the new moon and full moon. So in part, that is the significance of new moon and full moon for us. Uh, is that on those two occasions, the monks and nuns need to purify their vows. Uh, so if they have broken any of their 200 and plus uh, vows of training, they have to purify and confess. Uh, it's called sojong uh, or posada. Uh, so Atisha said, you know, there is not a two week period that I did not find, you know, some Pratimoksha vow that I have broken and I need to purify. He said, but then when I took the Bodhisattva vows, there isn't any 24 hour period that I could find that I did not break any of the Bodhisattva trainings. Because according to the Bodhisattva trainings, it's not two weeks. It's within a day and night. If you do not confess, then if you do not confess and purify, then you deteriorate your Bodhisattva vow. In Pratimoksha, the, the time frame is two weeks, basically, that you need to deal with it. If you don't deal with it, then you deteriorate your Pratimoksha. But when, when it is Bodhisattva vow, then 24 hours. So it's become tighter. Then Atisha said, and then when I finally, like when I receive, you know, tantric empowerment and I was given Samaya, he said, there is not a moment between one thought and another thought that I could not find an instance of breaking my Samaya vow. So the vows become increasingly tighter. Tight here, I, I don't think we should think of it as, you know, you become more tight, you know. Actually, you should practice becoming more free. Now, tighter here means, you know, they're more and more subtle. Huh? More and more subtle. So you become more and more over time. If you continue to train, you become more and more refined. So this is statement 25. Questions, comments? Anyone, any comments, any statement? Uh, hi. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes um, 
when it's referring to um, Vajrayana, Vajrayana practices, they say that it's like transforming emotions into or fictive emotions. Uh, and Mahayana is like about um, changing them and sort of, I think. And Hinayana is like a sort of um, avoiding. Right. Yeah. It is in this context, more or less, um, like um, this so, uh, subtle uh, changes um, in practice. And um, well, like when you're transforming, it is like uh, purifying. Say that again, your question. Yeah, like there are like these three ways of referring to uh, yes. practices, afflictive emotions, like you know, avoiding, then um, setting antidotes, and then uh, transforming them in, I guess, yeah. virtue. So from uh, Gilbert Rinpoche's uh, way of emphasizing, he will not uh, use that, that, that very common. I'm glad you brought it up. So that's another example where I say, uh, you, you need to um, you know, uh, study this topic by thinking about you know, how, how people normally talk about this. You know? It's actually quite different. Kyoburn Bujie will not use, use that way of explaining uh, and, and what you just said, yeah. Uh, especially I think in the writings of uh, teachings like Namkai Norbu Rinpoche and some of the you know teachers like you know Zogchen, and they, they they like to use that analogy. They say, uh, uh, and and not just them, but other Buddhists, other Tibetan Buddhists too. They will say, um, uh, uh, the Prati Moksha is uh, uses the approach of abandoning, uh, and then the Mahayana uses the approach of applying the antidote. And then the Vajrayana uses the way of transforming, right? And then, uh, and I think Namke Norbu Rinpoche will say, uh, Zogchen is not even transforming, it's just realizing. Hmm? Nothing to transform. Yeah. So, so yes, you know, this is clearly, uh, uh, very commonly uh, put in this way. Uh, and of course, it's not these modern teachers uh, making it up. You know, there there is some reference like that. You know, there are some examples given in some tantras or in some commentaries. Here, Kyoba Rinpoche will say, actually, yes, you might talk like that, but in fact, it is really when you get right down to it, it is about purifying. It is about removing that which is not there in the first place. Okay. Because, you know, I think later in Gongchik, we're going to see this address. And in the commentary, it will say, you know, it's not abandoning because what is there to abandon? There are some discussions about what 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 is abandoned. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like you, I guess you could say. I'll take that back. I'll take that back. You could say it's abandoning. What is it abandoning? It's abandoning the non-virtues. And it cannot be transforming because fire cannot be transformed into water. Fire, by definition, is fire. Water, by definition, is water. Anger cannot be transformed. Hatred cannot be transformed. But what makes 
hatred, hatred, that can be relinquished. Yeah, that can be relinquished. That can be purified. That can be abandoned. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, I'm not saying that the meaning is contradicting. Yeah. Again, this is a matter of what Kyoparambache finds to be a more skillful way of expressing it. A more accurate understanding is really what we're doing is we are purifying and purifying is sometimes a mysterious word, right? We use it so much in Buddhism, then we, we, we're not sure what we're talking about. It, it simply means to remove, right? And what are we removing? We are removing the afflictive emotions. And why are we removing the afflictive emotions? Because they are removable. And why are they removable? Because they are not part of the nature. And if they're not part of the nature, so they are not real. And because they're not real, they can be removed. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we will come to, uh, I remember, I don't know uh, right now exactly where, uh, but we will come to uh, a more specific discussion of this. I think it's in the chapter three on the Pratimoksha, where, where more detail, uh, Kyobarimpache's uh, statements about this. Is it purifying? Is it abandoning? Is it, you know, transforming? Uh, is it like realizing? In a way, it's all of that. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's almost, I feel like, you know, Kyobarimpache says, don't get too carried away by poetic expressions, you know, like transforming, you know, it's like, what do you mean by transforming, you know? <laughs> it's like, don't get, don't make it too literal. I, I suppose you could say that. Yeah. So even that model of saying, oh, Hinayana is to abandon, right? So, the way I look at that, how that, that can be useful, Hinayana is abandoned, Mahayana is applying antidote, Vajrayana is to transform, is to know when, you know, which approach is necessary. Sometimes with problems, with afflictive emotions, with you know, whatever that arises you know, that causes suffering, sometimes we have to just walk away. Sometimes we have, we just have to walk away from it. Cut your losses, walk away. <laughs> don't try to pure, pure, don't try to apply antidote. Don't try to transform. Is just cut your losses and walk away. So abandon. Sometimes cutting your losses and walking away is just avoidance. If you see that pattern in your life, you're just continually thinking, cutting losses, walk away, walk away. That is, you're avoiding something that you don't want to deal with. Then, when you recognize that that is a pattern, then you need to apply antidote. You need to cultivate the opposite of that. Because that's how you replace it, you know. You cultivate the opposite, then, then that afflictive emotion have no place to exist. That's how you purify, actually. You, you're actually replacing. So you're actually removing, right? So then you take the applying antidote approach. And then sometimes, when you realize the nature of what's going on, that realization itself can dispel 
because you stop feeding it. That's sort of the Vajrayana. But essentially what, what's happening is you are removing that which causes suffering. And that's what we call purifying. Right? You're removing. Statement 611. Now we go to chapter 6. <laughs> because it's related to, uh, actually, uh, it's related to the statement that we just looked at. The two statements. Yeah, it's because uh, statement 26, uh, 27 uh, in chapter 1, 6, statement 26, uh, 27 and 28, I believe, they are addressing, you know, like what is the um, kind of essence of Buddhahood? Statement 26, 27, 28. And what is the essence of Buddhahood? So, so those three statements uh, are together in that sense, uh, a, a specific topic. Um, so now we want to continue in the topic of um, learning more about the nature of vows. How, how are they all the same point? Uh, and then when they are differentiated, how they are differentiated, right? That's the last two statements we looked at. Now let's look at this issue of vow, but in the context of conduct, right? Chapter six, the topic is the view, the meditative practice, uh, the habituating. Remember, we're talking about habituating. Now, about conduct, meaning how do you behave? Yeah. So if you recall, uh, on chapter 6, the last statement that we looked at, it's talking about once you have been introduced to the nature of your mind, then from that point on, what we call meditative practice, uh, what we call gompa, is Kumpa uh, is habituating. Uh, once you have recognized the nature of mind, once you have successfully recognized it based on being introduced to it by uh, the guru, then uh, what we call practice, meditative practice, what we call bhavana, what we call cultivating, is actually habituating. That's 10, statement 10. Statement 11 now is going to address, now as for conduct, as to how uh, we carry ourselves, how we behave, uh, what, what do we need to do? So here it says, the conduct that is without accepting and abandoning is the precious discipline conduct. Okay, so what's going on here is this. Uh, often you will find in Mahamudra material, uh, in uh, Vajrayana, like highest yoga tantra Vajrayana material, mm, and also in um, like Dzogchen material, uh, expression of conduct without that is without accepting or abandoning. That means you 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 neither accept nor abandon. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, people think, oh, that means do whatever you want now because you are beyond karma. In fact, yeah, I think a lot of the problems that have arisen among communities where teachers or leaders misbehave in Buddhist communities, they might not like explicitly say, this is what we're doing, but I think this has become a way to excuse. Uh, afflictive emotions uh, and say, oh, I'm beyond mm, accepting and abandoning. But here, Kyobarambaji says, you know, the real meaning of without accepting or abandoning is mm, disciplined conduct. So this, I'm sure all of us, you know, will remember uh, when we were 
16 and the parents say you know and and 16 is when we are so committed to freedom you know i'm a grown person i need i'm free i need to be free i need to be free and then you remember your parents saying you know as long as you live under this roof you are living under my rule <laughs> so this statement would be like you know oh god <laughs> so boring you know so controlling but here kevin Rinpoche says you know actually the real beyond accepting and abandoning is to observe the precious shila, the precious disciplined conduct that the Buddha taught. So this is said in response to, so that 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 uh, statement before, people claim that the view is dharmata, emptiness and mahamudra, and that the conduct is freedom from accepting virtue and rejecting evil. So yeah, this is exactly what some of uh, some some of the writings, uh, some of the teachings that you'll hear will say this. Uh, when you have the view of dharmata, when you have the view of emptiness, when you have the view of mahamudra, then your conduct should be beyond, you know, beyond accepting virtue, rejecting evil, all of that. It should go beyond that. In fact, like last night, if you were attending the Milarepa series that I was teaching Ecuadorians and uh, Peruvians, uh, the last song, the last sentence, it uh, Milarepa says, you know, I'm now beyond accepting and rejecting. Uh, and and or, or, or more specifically, no, it says, uh, now uh, virtue and non-virtue are not two. All right, virtue and non-virtue are not two. So there again, you know, it's so easy to misunderstand a statement like that to say, oh, you know, see, Milarepa has achieved the level where uh, uh, virtue and non-virtue is the same now. But this is not what Milarepa means. Right? It means that when you have so completely purified your afflictive emotions, right? You don't need to anymore think about, oh, this I can do, this I cannot do, this I should do, this I should not do. The basis for even creating negativity is no longer there. And therefore, you don't need to say, oh, this I can do, this I cannot do, this I should do, this I should not do. This I want to do, this I don't want to do. That notion is gone. But it's not gone because, you know, you don't care. Because that's another way you can say, huh? virtue and non-virtue is irrelevant now because you don't give a hoot. <laughs> you don't give a bleep about whatever consequences come. No, no, that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, here, non-virtue and virtue uh, is non-dual. Uh, you're beyond accepting and abandoning because your realization of Mahamudra has completely purified, you know, any, yeah, any uh, possibility of creating non-virtue. So here. Uh, in Chodra's commentary, it says, the conduct, which is without accepting and abandoning of the realization that is true reality and emptiness is the precious discipline conduct. All evil and non-virtue, which is not to be accepted, is primordially what is prohibited. All virtue, which is not to be abandoned, is primordially what one must accomplish. So that's the definition of the precious conduct. Such a disciplined conduct is the abandoning of attachment and aversion. And so this is very helpful. To be free from accepting and rejecting, or here translated as accepting and abandoning, means to be free from attachment and aversion. Attachment to what? Not attachment to, you know, like virtuous conduct. 
an aversion towards non-virtuous conduct, but attachment to what you like and aversion to what you dislike. Such a disciplined conduct is the abandoning of attachment and aversion, the conduct free from accepting and abandoning. Alternatively, the meaning is that the cause or source of samsara and the lower realms is not allowed, uh, is proscribed, as I said, and the path of liberation and nirvana is not abandoned. Alternatively, the meaning is that the cause or source of samsara and the lower realms is not accepted and the path of liberation and nirvana is not abandoned. Moreover, one does not accept that to which one is attached and one does not abandon that for which one has aversion. Meaning the things that you don't like, you know that you habitually don't like, at this point, you no longer try to push them away. Things that you're not comfortable with. People that you don't like, you don't try to get rid of them. Things that you like, situations that you like, people that you like, conditions that you like. You're not attached to them. So he says, this is the true meaning of uh, without accepting or rejecting. Therefore, the Lord Drigumpa said, the conduct that is without accepting and abandoning is a body and speech that is free from attachment and aversion. If one has a mistaken understanding of that, then one roams in samsara. So the intended meaning of accepting and abandoning uh, and uh, therefore Going beyond accepting and abandoning is to be without attachment and aversion. If one illustrates this concerning food alone, it is like the following. The Shravakas eat food as a nourishing medicine. So eat with the thought to reverse the illness of hunger, I will eat this. This teaches that they are free from attachment and aversion. The food of the Bodhisattva is such that the Bodhisattva Pitaka teaches that one must eat with the thought of benefiting 80,000 worms of the body and so forth. Uh, so here is another good example of same activity done in three uh, different like capacities. So at the Pratimoksha level, when you eat, you have to think, uh, this is medicine uh, for counteracting the illness of hunger. Uh, so in this point, I am not even a practitioner of Pratimoksha. Uh, because most of the time I eat, mm, yum, yum, so good. <laughs> it's due to attachment, you know. Mm, yum, 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 you know, this tastes good, this doesn't taste good, you know. You know so, so much suffering and trouble, you know, between uh, here and here. <laughs> <laughs> between here and here. That's it, you know. <laughs> But if you really have the Pratimoksha understanding, then when you eat food, you know, you say, this is medicine. Then if you evolve to the Bodhisattva level, then you're thinking, oh, not only uh, this is food to overcome hunger, uh, this is also nourishment for all the worms uh, that depend on my body being alive. All the germs, I'm feeding them. Then the mantra practitioner offers the inner burnt offering to the mandala of the deity of the body and the three seats. The three seats is talking about male and female Buddhas, 
male and female bodhisattvas and male and female wrathful deities. This is the vase empowerment uh, knowledge, understanding. As it is said, food stuff and similarly beverages, you should take up with it as you find it. Since pleasant and unpleasant are only thoughts, you should not in the least be attached to it. So this is a quotation from the Hevajra Tantra, a Vajrayana source. So you see here this example, you know, it, it shows in chapter one, the statement that we looked at. It gives the example of how the three levels of taking food. But the point that is emphasized here is giving up attachment and aversion. Don't eat with attachment. Don't eat with aversion. Yeah, meaning when you eat, don't say, oh, this is good, this is not good. I like this, I don't like this. And try to train with. Yeah. If you don't like, you know, think this is good medicine for the body. <laughs> Even if you don't like, you think, oh, but I need to feed the 80,000 worms and germs. And even if you don't like, you say, you know, this is Gana Chakra for the deities. Because in Gana Chakra, you transform all of this into ambrosia. Briefly, the meaning is not not accepting virtue and not abandoning evil. So the meaning is not not accepting virtue, not abandoning evil. Yet, in the pure conduct, there is no thought of being attached to virtue and averted from non-virtue, no matter how low or supreme low or middling the object is. So important is don't be attached. Now, the conduct that someone accomplishes who possesses the realization of the view so it says, you know, like if you want to know someone really have the real liberating view, and not view in the sense of philosophical uh, uh, beliefs uh, or philosophical uh, positions that you are attached to, uh, but view, right? In the sense that, remember when we we're talking about view? In the sense of view that is endowed with realization. If you want to know, it says, you know, if someone has the view that liberates, then look at the person's conduct. It's a conduct by way of the absence of attachment and aversion toward what is the essential thing. That is the precious three trainings. If you want to know, you know, if this person really has achieved yourself then, if you want to know, you know, if you have really achieved the right view, then look at in your conduct, you know, to what degree are you still struggling with attachment and aversion? If you're still living your life completely controlled by attachment and aversion, then you have not yet achieved the view. You have not yet glimpsed the view. Here, view in the sense of realization. Conversely, if you say, do I have some realization? Well, sometimes that's hard to figure out, you know? You're like, I don't know. Do I or do I not? <laughs> that means, first thing, that means the realization is not very powerful, but it doesn't mean that there's no realization. So the way to gauge that is to say, you know, since practicing Dharma, have my attachment and aversion remained the same or become less? Or increased? <laughs> if it has increased, then, oh, not going in the good direction. If it has remained the same, that means you're not applying this right. But if it has been reduced, then you know, ah, you know, must be. Yeah? Some realization is there. Even if it is fleeting, some realization is there. Some realization about nature of things, nature of mind is there. 
Ja? Dr. Hunt. Yes. What is the 80,000 worms? Oh, it's just all the germs that is in your body. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is just, you know, Tibetan way of talking about you know, what we call germs, amoeba, you know, bacteria, viruses. Yeah. Well, wait, bacteria is non-sentient for the most part? I don't know. Although now they say that bacteria might be some sentient. Yeah, anyway. Basically, yeah, all, all, all the germs. Yeah. And the worms, you know, you might have worms in your body, you know, you have to feed them, it says, you know. Then in the Samadhi Raja Sutra, it says, if someone having heard the Dharma, so now uh, even a more subtle form of attachment and aversion, uh, not just like the gross one that I've been talking about, but here in relation to Dharma. Yeah? And Shantideva actually also talks about this. It says, if someone having heard the Dharma develops attachment and upon seeing something that is not Dharma gives rise to anger, if he overcomes such arrogant pride, that will be good. So even with regards to Dharma, you know, we have to be careful so that it doesn't get mixed up to, with pride. He says, this is basically pride. Because you have, you have like embraced the Dharma, right? Then when you see Dharma, you, you, you develop attachment towards it. And conversely, when you see uh, that which is the opposite of Dharma, uh, somebody doing it or somebody expressing it, then you get very angry. Or if someone insults Buddhism, or if someone insults you know, Tibetan Buddhism, or if someone insults you know, your guru, uh, then you become very angry. Uh, here it says, if you overcome such arrogant pride, and this sutra here really points out exactly what's going on is basically your pride. Because you say, you have, you have associated yourself with this. So when someone says something about it, it's not even you're so concerned about damaging this. It's your pride. You know? If you overcome such arrogant pride, that will be good. Otherwise, by the power of pride, you will experience suffering. Shantideva says, you know, he quotes there, he says, you know, if uh, those who become angry and strike back when they see someone insulting the Dharma or destroying the temples and statues and stupas. If someone reacts with anger and retaliates, they are not my disciples. Shantideva quotes the Buddha. They are not my disciples. But I think many Buddhists feel they need to defend Buddhism in this way. This is not defending Buddhism. This is not. You defend the Buddha Dharma with your own practice, your own conduct. Therefore, in short, bring out the five dharmas in all the way, in all that may be done, such as eating, acting, standing, sitting, and practicing, without acceptance and attachment by enjoying them and without aversion and abandonment by not enjoying them and exert yourself in that. This explanation is the perfection of the intention. Yeah, so um, in the notes by uh, Sobich, uh, he provides more details. Uh, and uh, today we don't have time, but when we continue on Friday, I want to look at those notes, those notes there. Uh, but you, you should read, uh, read. Uh, ahead, uh, 611, 612, 
and 613. This is all about conduct. Then 614 is about the qualities. It says Mahamudra is the embodiment of all qualities. And that links us back to chapter 1. Remember, the next three statements of chapter 1 is about the qualities of Buddhahood. Yeah, really. Uh, so then here, 614, 615, 616 uh, is the qualities. Uh, it's amazing, you know, uh, the connection between chapter six and chapter one. Um, I, 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 I have not seen anyone directly engaging these two chapters. Uh, but when you read these two chapters uh, side by side, uh, they inform each other. Uh, there's something very amazing going on here. I, I, I had a sense that there was a connection. That's, so I'll be forthright with you. I have a sense that there is a connection. When I first read about how in the earliest commentaries, the arrangements of the chapters, sometimes what is now chapter 6 was chapter 1, and what is now chapter 1 is chapter 6. So picking up on that clue, so to say, I started to read the two together. And I see how sections, uh, they, 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 they mutually kind of reinforce each other. Uh, they support each other uh, in a very uh, meaningful way. So now I'm seeing more and more. And then, of course, thanks to the opportunity to study this together with you guys, uh, I'm, I'm getting to see more and more uh, these amazing, mysterious connections between these two chapters. Questions or comments? So part of the website uh, idea is to also post uh, on the website these maybe all the recordings can also be moved uh, to the website eventually uh, then maybe also like uh, short uh, reflections like that uh, on the gongchik uh, is published on the website i think it's useful for us to go back and look again and again you know again uh, the format of facebook is not very conducive to a, a sustained engagement it's it's for the you know uh, attention deficit disorder types which is increasingly all of us so facebook can direct attention to the website you know as a way to take the next step sort of evolve you know you start with social media then you get to the website <laughs> then you internalize the website you know completely so the website is the middling uh, facebook is the lower and then the highest you know is when you you have you know internalized all of this then you uh, should be sharing this and teaching others this You should make those aspirations, you know, not out of pride, you know, but out of like, you know, I, I, I need to take a leadership role in whatever leadership, but I need to take a leadership role in ensuring that these you know, precious teachings are passed down directly, indirectly assume leadership role, take responsibility, support efforts to to make this more available 
uh, in a more skillful way. Not available, like I said, you know. Sometimes available becomes so scattered, uh, then it's also not useful. Yeah. So that's it uh, today. Uh, and um, good. Good. Very good. Oh, Chris, you're actually alive. Call me out. Conjusem churim punche Magye panam ke Ke pa nyam pa me pa yam Go neng go ndu pe Quickly want to thank uh, any, every one of you who have been sending your support, whether to Urban Dharma or to me or the translation project. Uh, I'm not very good at individually responding to all your support. Uh, but if you have a suspicion that you sent something and then it went into some black hole somewhere, you want to confirm with me, then please check with me. Uh, some of you uh, are also, uh, like also trying to set up a, a monthly you know, contribution to Urban Dharma. Uh, sometimes that that setup is easy to accomplish, sometimes not so easy. Uh, recently, some one of you helping another person who is not part of this group to do for Urban Dharma. I check with me and I check with the treasurers and it didn't go through, then you know we can try again. So anyway, uh, the point is that uh, um, if you uh, have sent things my way, uh, either directly to me or via somewhere else to come to me. Uh, if you are not sure whether it, it got here, uh, let me know. But otherwise, uh, I, you can assume I did get what you sent and I appreciate you know, uh, what you are doing uh, for sure. And I will uh, do my best to put to good use uh, whatever that you are helping and sending and contributing. Uh, and together, let's see, you know, we can do something not just for ourselves, but beyond ourselves. Uh, I have ambitions, I have ideas, you know, but I don't have that much skills to get everything uh, figured out and worked out. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm glad, you know, that you all are helping in whatever ways uh, you are able to help. So think about, you know, the, that website project and, uh, you know, think about uh, the app and uh, uh, so, um, and at the same time, I, I should now be blunt to say, you know, and if you like offer to help and uh, somehow, you know, it's not always possible either, you know, to take every offer of help. Uh, sometimes it ends up being even delaying more. Uh, also, please don't be, don't feel like you have been rejected, you know. I said, this is all about like buying shoes, you know. Mm. Uh, is the analogy of buying shoes, you know. You might look like a pair of shoes and you think they're perfect for your feet, you know, but it might not. Huh? Then if you try to keep uh, being stubborn about it being perfect, you know, it'll be so much suffering walking around in those shoes. And so uh, the shoes have to fit, you know, and sometimes it takes longer to figure out the fit. Uh, but uh, it's not... The shoes have rejected your feet. It's not your feet. Eh? It's not good enough for the shoes. It's not. It's the right fit. Eh? So that also, please keep in mind. Yeah. But that you are trying the shoes, you know, that is always appreciated. Yeah? <laughs> okay, Tata. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Laura.